I want to talk about something which I haven't actually seen spoken about anywhere, which isn't to say that it hasn't been spoken about, but in all the Facebook groups, internet forums and so on that I look at, I haven't seen anyone talk about this. And <clears throat> my experience was quite profound. So I thought if I share that with you for new brain attack survivors, new brain injury survivors, it might be something to think about. And what that topic is, is going outside for the first time. Now, my circumstances were such that I had about three weeks in hospital. I left hospital in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk unaided. I could shuffle. That was about it. But eventually with physiotherapy, hard work, perseverance, all the rest of it, I got to the stage where I could walk on my own unaided with a stick. Now, I have to say at this point that that sounds large and fine. But what you have to bear in mind is I've got bad vertigo. Everything's spinning around me. I've got double vision, both vertically and horizontally. So I've got prisms attached to my glasses to try and correct the double vision, which it does. The downside is it's like looking through smeared Vaseline. And I'm very unsteady on my feet. So I can't see very well. I'm unsteady on my feet and I'm wobbling around all over the place. So that's the context in which I went out in the big wide world for the first time. We were living in Oxfordshire at the time. We now live in southern Scotland. We were living in Oxfordshire and uh, there's a small town called Tame, which wasn't too far away from where we were living. And we'd always, prior to my brain attack, we'd always gone there for maybe lunch or a coffee or a bit of shopping or whatever. And quite liked it. I actually, uh, funny, just sprung to mind, I actually did a, a, a gig there once. Um, somebody's birthday party, I think, do you remember they hired a room at the back of one of the pubs or hotels there? Anyway, not to worry. <clears throat> so, my wife drives, I'm still not driving, my wife drives, we park up, and it's somewhere that I'm familiar with. Now, I've been working at home on a level carpeted floor. I've been walking on a treadmill, which is a level surface moving at a predetermined speed. I hadn't factored in to my ability to walk at this stage. I hadn't factored in the fact that the world, real world out there is not either level and carpeted or level and moving at a set speed that you can cope with. And I hadn't factored into the, the account either that there are other people who are going about their business and doing their thing. I hadn't thought about this at all. So my wife parks the car, get out of the car and walk slowly into the main high street. And I'm walking gingerly and slowly. I can't very well, I can't see very well. It's a bright sunshine day I'm talking probably August time something like that and sunshine in my eye I can't see very well but boy oh boy is stuff happening fast people are coming at me and boom this way boom that way I hadn't thought next thing somebody's come past me boom like this and it's like oh my god I can't I'm moving over I can't really walk I can't really and I just froze absolute froze. My wife is a few yards ahead of me, turns around, are you okay? And it's like, uh, I don't know what's going on. You've probably seen on the TV, on movies, where stuff gets speeded up. So you'll, there's a very famous thing we had here in the UK when I was a kid, which was London to Edinburgh in 15 minutes. And it was a speeded up camera was at the front of a train. It was the train journey from London to Edinburgh, which normally takes three hours these days, probably took four or five in those days, but it was sped up. 
So you saw it, you did the whole journey in about 15 minutes. And it was like that. It was just unbelievable. I'd been so used to, I suppose institutionalized, but so used to my own little world where we were living in the house, walking down the corridor, doing my exercises, walking back up the corridor, doing my exercises, going to the conservatory, getting on the treadmill, holding on to the treadmill, walking along, listening to my music for about five minutes before my brain melted. I've been so used to that life for two, three months, maybe. Actually going out into the real world saying, yes, I can do it now. I'm OK. I look at me. I can, I can walk. I hadn't factored in the real world because I'd forgotten really what it was like. And when you're in the real world, if you don't have a stroke brain injury, it's fine. I was vooming around, vroom, 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 vroom. That was my life. When you can't do that and you're not used to that, all of a sudden, the world is a lot different. It's a lot scarier. It's a lot faster moving. There's all kinds of things. There's, there's now, the paving slabs are slightly like this, so you stumble a bit over the paving slab, and, and then and then you need to cross the road, and there's a curb, and you've got to step down the curb, and then you've got to go across the road, and there's maybe a drain cover, a manhole cover in the road that you've got to navigate. At the same time, there's cars wanting to get by, and you get to the other side of the road, and now there's another curb, and you've got to step up onto that curb, but there's people there coming at you from either way, and it's like, well, if I step up onto the curb now, am I going to be able to avoid them, or will they avoid me? And kind of judgments, things that your brain would do normally, pre-brain injury, and would calculate distances and work things out and go, no, I'll just wait for this guy to come on. I'll hop up there and I'll hop, I'll hop through the gap between this person coming from my right and this person coming from my left and I'll nip through the gap and pop into the butchers. And you kind of make that decision like that. When your brain is addled, when your brain is damaged, when your brain is injured, you, you can't make those snap judgments. You can't process all of that data, the person moving here, the person moving there, the distance to move to get into the butcher shop. By the time you've computed all that, it's the next day. So you kind of are a bit hesitant because you kind of like, well, is they, are they, are they, well, can I, what the, ooh. And for me, I just froze. It's like, I can't go because I don't know if I can do it. So I'll just kind of waiting for a gap and a gap never comes. The other thing <laughs> was people who walk straight at you looking at their mobile phone. Yes, I was guilty of that. Didn't really think about people with sticks, people with mobility problems, people with wheelchairs, people with push chairs, whatever. Didn't think about it. Just, I'm coming through. <laughs> oh, hold on, just respond to this. So I remember vividly, I had one guy walking at me. I could see him from maybe 10 yards away and he was looking at his mobile. He wasn't looking where he was going. So I'm thinking, what do I do? I, I don't have the mobility to elegantly nip to one side and then back again to let him by. He can't see me. And he's, as he's getting closer, I realized he's gonna climb it. So I stopped to give him the opportunity to see me and move around me. But he didn't, he just continued to get closer. And the only thing I could think of by the time he got to about two yards away was I had my walking stick and I just hammered it into the ground to make as loud a noise as possible. And he looked up at the last minute, swerved past me and went the other way. But it was, it was scary. It sounds daft, somebody's walking at you. That's scary, yeah, somebody's walking by you. Somebody's coming out the other way, somebody's coming... Yeah, it's like, whoa, what the hell is going on? All of a sudden, my nice, quiet, cosseted existence, as somebody's gone, taken the pin out of the hand grenade, lobbed it in the middle, and you're now dealing with this explosion. And it was all the colours and all the sounds. Everything was just, I now know, sensory overload. Normally, what our brains do is they, they, they grow up 
in this environment and they learn I can filter that out, I can filter that out, ignore that, ignore that, I just focus on this. My experience post brain attack was my filters were a, you've learned over time, well that gets switched off, that gets, everything was there. There was no filtering. So my brain is trying to process all of this information at the same time as opposed to what it normally does. It's got all this information, but it's filtered out that one. It's just dealing with that. That didn't happen. So it was a very disturbing, upsetting experience. And just to build on that, I found the same thing for noisy environments. So for example, open the door to go into a cafe, stepping in and there's a, it's busy, there's a lot of noise going on and maybe it's quite an echoey environment so maybe there's a sort of natural reverb and stuff echoing around in the rafters and all the rest of it, I'm out. I remember one occasion walking into our local coffee shop here, one of them anyway, the Hoot and Cat, and I walked in and I walked straight back out again, past my wife, almost shoved her out of the way, I, it was just... It was like you've got 20 people around you and they're all hitting something, saucepan, drum, cymbal, tea tray, whatever, all at different times, different pitches, and you're, you, it's just complete overload, sensory overload. You're totally overwhelmed and it's in, no, out. Basically the flight or flight response kicks in and you're out. And I was probably about 50 yards down the road before my wife caught up with me and managed to grab hold of me. And I didn't know that I'd travelled 50 yards. I remember going in and I remember the cacophony and that's it. The next thing, I'm 50 yards down the road. So I kind of had some kind of mental blockage, mental seizure, mental breakdown, you know, call it what you will, but a little chunk of missing time where my brain had obviously gone, I can't cope with this no. and I just switched off and it was the same thing with temperature not quite that bad but if I went in somewhere that not only was noisy but was hot and stuffy as well couldn't cope absolutely couldn't cope I'm not brilliant now seven and a half years on with noisy environments depends on how I'm feeling if it's a good day and the brain fog has lifted temporarily then I, I can cope but if it's a bad day what I call my zombie days then I probably won't go out people don't see me when it's the bad day it might be the same for a lot of brain injury survivors I don't know but when when it's a bad day I can't I can't function so I don't go out so when I see people they'll say oh yeah you're doing well aren't you it's like yeah you haven't seen me for two weeks have you so what have I been doing in those two weeks? I'll tell you, shall I? Not a lot. But you don't know that because you haven't seen me for two weeks. When my brain has been frazzled, when I'm struggling to string a sentence together, when things are annoying me, when the ticking of the clock is really <laughs> loud and you haven't seen me then because I don't go out. So I think it's a salutary lesson for any recent brain injury survivor out there who's, who's listening to this. When you go out for the first time, just, just bear in mind that it's a whole lot different to what you've been experiencing in your home, when you've been having physiotherapy, when you've been doing any of your work with any of your specialists that's in a controlled environment it's in a gym it's in a rehab center it's in your own home whatever it's on a treadmill in my case because walking was an issue but it's a controlled calm environment and it's easy to forget that the world out there isn't like that it's it's chaotic and it does its own thing and all of a sudden you're dropped into it and you've got a function and it's not easy so i hope that's been of some use interest 
um, and look after yourselves and take care.